Hey, um, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignites. Today, I'm really honoured to have Joe Wheeler. Um, and we're going to be talking about his book, The Digital First Customer um, Experience, Seven Design Strategies from the World Leading Brands. And I was just telling Joe before we, we came on um, that um, I read this while I was on holiday. And um, I, I'm, I was amazed about some of the things in the book. For example, you use um, seven case studies. But these are not where you basically go across the top and skim across. You go into a lot of detail. But we're going to get into this in a moment. Joe, I always ask this question. Where can people find you? A uh, couple places. Obviously on LinkedIn, quite a bit. And then at um, our company website is cxdigital.ai. And my speaking website is joewheeler.co. So um, you, you, one of the things that you one of the things that you said to me just before we came on live, which is that you you went into the future and came back with some things, and I agree with you. <laughs> um, you know, AI, the metaverse, th these are these social media. They, these are these are not the future. They're they're the now. Yeah, um, and the seven case studies that you do are companies that and and they haven't just did it five minutes ago they've been doing it for so that so so the spotify one that you do um again goes into so much detail i was telling joe before we came on i was on holiday when i re read this and and it's so much detail and i'm a, clearly a boring person because i ended up talking to my partner saying did you know spotify do this and did you know spotify did that? and did you know they do this like I, I, she finds it interesting, so probably why she's 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 with me. But then 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 the next one, because I thought it was just going to be um, high tech. The next one is a cement company, a cement company focusing on customer experience and customer service. It's like really. So anyway, so um, in terms of the the structure of the book, you you I know you said that you've actually broken it down into three distinct areas. It's actually quite a thick book as well, um, and you start off in in one, which is you talk about the three C's. Yeah, why don't you talk us through what you mean by that? Yeah, and Tim, first of all, great to be here, and thank you for You're reading. Book I'll, I'll, I will shut up. I'm just <laughs> I'm passionate about it. Sorry. Um, so the three C's, so one of the things that we all lived through through COVID was seeing one of these C's around culture change, right, in terms of social injustice and things like that, that, you know, kind of the, uh, the cap was taken off the lid. And we, and we just all had to understand how do, we, how do we collaborate and work and get things done through a pandemic? Like that was a new thing, right? So culture, the impact of that on culture, and the other piece I put into culture is around climate change, right? And so we were just talking about, you know, half of British Columbia is still burning. Uh, this is not a usual thing. Uh, so there is not a part of the world that isn't impacted by climate change. So companies, from a corporate standpoint, I mean, you really have to think through, you know, what's your what's your plan and strategy around that? And the second one is around um, this notion of um, convergence of technologies. So Tim, not a lot of people realize. Um, and it's going to take time, but the the difference between something like 5G and 6G in terms of speed, when 6G is fully operational, which will probably, you know, not near the end of this decade, maybe the beginning of the 2030s, but it's going to be 30 to 50 times fast, faster than 5G. Not 30% faster, 30. Think about that for a half a second. And that's going to have a big impact, um, et cetera. And then obviously competition. So the competitive set that you had maybe two years ago may be fundamentally different as industries through technology will start to, you'll see much more non-traditional competition. Um, and I use the example of, of Netflix and um, um, when they were basically competing with Blockbuster, Blockbuster just never saw them coming because they built such a strong value network, right? So culture, uh, competition and convergence. And I, and I, I, I totally agree. And I, and I, you know, I've just actually got off a podcast talking about AI um, and people, um, people don't realize that, that, that there's been, you know, there's a whole load of hype and then it's kind of died down, but AI is going to be, you know, you, you, your ability to understand AI, just like we understand spreadsheets and, and PowerPoints 
we are going to go need to use we're going to use AI just as much as as that. And at the moment, it's fairly rudimentary. It's a bit like um, I remember when the BlackBerry came out, and I I I, I was desperate for one of those because it made me look like I was important. <laughs> um, and and um, and and how much I loved it. And of course, it's nothing on the iPhone. And that's the kind of step change that we're going to see in terms of um, of, of, of technology. Yeah, it, one of the things that um, studying and collaborating with these companies and the case studies in the, in the book, Tim, is so I'm a tennis pro. I teach tennis, right? And so okay. if you play tennis, um, we'd have a good game. But w w when I play with someone really good, I, I it lifts my game tremendously. Yes. Like there's the pro here at the local club and he is a wonderful, you know, top 100 player in the country. And, and um, when I feel like splurging, I'll play with him. And it's the same thing with machine learning AI companies that have been on this for the past number of years are at just a different level. You know what I mean? And so the thing that is often missed about machine learning piece is the learning piece. <laughs> <laughs> so I often say when it comes to applying technology to customer experiences, the back end is the front end. Like what makes something like lemonade so impressive? I mean, their design is beautiful and it's incredibly domain specific and intuitive and customers really like it. But what makes it powerful is the machine learning behind the scenes that gets smarter every day as it learns from its interaction. It's, it's amazing. I nearly wrote to, after I read that chapter, if I wasn't on holiday, I would have written to lemonade and said, why don't you offer your services in the UK? If I want to buy it. <laughs> yeah. It's, and yeah, I was explaining it to my girlfriend. She said, we want it. I said, they don't do it. But I want right. <laughs> we want that service. I know, but they don't do it. <laughs> it's well, an amazing, I mean, you know, that 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 business model where they've because um you, you, you know, we're we're still used to in certainly in financial services, people that have basically put this lipstick on the pig of yeah. you know, most of the financial services, big financial services in um in this country use mainframes. Yeah. Um and um so they're using 1960s, 1970s technology to to run a, a company in 2023. So so they don't they won't tell you, but they can't actually get the systems to meet certain legislation. None of the banks meet GDPR regulations that came out in 2018 wow. because you're supposed to delete something and they can't delete it on a mainframe. Wow. So and but they won't tell you this. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say anything. Sorry. <laughs> um and you and um but lemonade have completely turned the whole thing on its head and provided a different service. Well, and a different business model. Like yes. what makes it unique? Is it just like it's a digital first, mobile centric? They're very, when the whole industry went in, at least in the US, Tim went to like, I switched and saved. They focused on new renters, you know, people renting an apartment for the first time, knowing that if they did a good job and earned their loyalty, when they needed pet insurance, when they needed home insurance, when they needed a car insurance, Lemonade would grow with them. And in fact, it's proven to be true. Like a customer that started with Lemonade and moves to four products, I think it's like nine times more profitable than a single product user. So their theory of this flywheel is um, has been proven. And, and that's what, I mean, if there's one big takeaway from the book I share with people is this notion of if there's a flywheel in your business that is sort of, you know, has the chance to, onboard customers at a relatively low cost, then you can learn about them with machine learning and AI and then personalize the experience so it's more relevant without being creepy. At Spotify, as you know, Tim, they, they talk about the transition uh, from the attention economy to the value economy. And I think that's a big deal. You know, that idea of saying, we're gonna earn loyalty and subscription growth, not just by figuring out what the next click is that might attract you, but to create more value for you, you know, to kind of increase your listening moments and things like that. So that's what's powerful is what machine learning can produce for companies is this flywheel um, if there's a target segment. Like, for example, with Lemonade, I love this statistic. They have a chat bot called AI Maya. So when you start buying insurance, you interact with this and it's a computer, right? Um, now, when um, AI Maya will ask you 13 questions to figure out what price to give you. And to make yeah. sure that that you know, based on your where your apartment or home is, stuff like that. When she does that, she generates seventeen hundred data points about that customer. It's instantaneously. It, it is mind blowing, right? 
<laughs> Whereas when you sit with a traditional insurance company, if I'm your agent, I might fill out 50 fields on the form and say, hey, Tim, it's 430. Let's hit the pub. <laughs> I, I was, I, I was, yeah, I, I think I was reading, I think I was reading this on the plane and he'd go, did I read that right? Because, because <laughs> exactly. normally, yeah, give me a data point. Well, there's the name, address, age. Um, right, right. And so, so that's why people tend, often when they think about generative AI and things like that, there's lot, there are lots of cost savings, but you know, the front end of the, of the experience as you and I know it today is just going to be fundamentally different in the next three to four years as generative AI starts to scale more quickly. Yeah, and, and so so you, you, you have seven of these um, uh, case studies. And as I said, it's not something skimming across the top and it's not um, FinTech, Spotify, because you, you actually, as I said, you've got a cement company. Yeah. Who, yeah. who have actually re kind of redesigned what they're doing around cement? Well, and what I love about Semex, you know, we've um, I, I taught the Semex case study many years ago when they built the service guarantee in Mexico City. Like, think about that: you offer customers a service guarantee around cement delivery in a pretty complicated city to get around in any car, let alone <laughs> let alone a cement truck. <laughs> So, but what is important, as we often say in the product development business, focus on the problem, not your solution. Like yeah. the problem for a construction foreman, when uh, the cement truck shows up late and you have 180 uh, laborers w w right standing there making 38 bucks an hour or more ready to use this ready mix. When that doesn't come, you know, the problem they solve by being able to digitize uh, is just enormous. And in fact, you know, that's an industry, Tim, that hasn't seen a productivity gain from digital of more than like 1% in 20 years. So in some ways, you could say it was a $20 bill lying on the floor. Like, you know, they just kind of. But at the same time, here's what's interesting about Semex. And this is what is lost on a lot of people in terms of thinking about um, customer experience design. Because the traditional thinking is, well, just understand the customer's pain points and then design the experience to solve them. But, you know, they didn't start there. To me, that's interesting. They started by benchmarking world-class companies using digital technology and how they use it. And the reason why this matters is if you start with the obvious, which is just look at the problems and don't have a step in there that looks at technology, you will just naturally project your, your, project your past experience about how to solve those things. Whereas if you know there's a technology that can do X, when you see that problem, You'll, you'll design a different solution. I guarantee it. And that's what's interesting. They looked at that and then they went to the customer to really understand how they solve those problems. So how does a, how does a company run a project like this? Is it, do, do, you, um, do you set up a separate company or do you take a, a team? Is it part-time? Is it full-time? What, what do you do when you need to, because, and, and do you look at the end-to-end -end process? How do you do it? Yeah, so it depends on exactly to your point about is it end to end? Is it a very specific thing you're trying to solve? So it'll depend on what the scope of the project is, Tim. Um, but no, it, you, typically you'll put a team on this and it depends on the level of innovation. So we always use this, I call this term the three lane highway, which is lane one is how do you fix things that are just, you know, customers are telling you loud and clear, get this solved in 90 days because you're creating detractors. And then what's medium term, which is what are improvements that employees, customers, and shareholders would benefit from if you got that right? And then the big innovation is how do you become a lemonade? How do you change business model disruption, right? So it depends on which of those three things are. But my point is that if you, um, so understand the problems you're trying to solve first and foremost, and don't be confused. Sometimes the squeaky wheel doesn't deserve the oil, if you know what I mean. Like, Sometimes customers aren't really telling you out loud where the biggest improvements are for lots yeah. of different reasons. But, you know, I've been at this game a long time, Tim, and I guarantee you, you know, for a segment of customers, there are probably three to five loyalty drivers that if you can determine what those things are in a weighted fashion and what kind of interactions in the experience shape a high score, um, then you can really start to understand and marry solutions, technology enabled or human enabled or logistically enabled that will close the gap in that and create an emotionally satisfying experience across channels. That's the tricky part today. So um, the uh, the third part of the book, you've got a, um, a set of four chapters, which is a practical piece. I hope so.
um, uh, which is where you walk through how does demonstrate a return on, on, on investment, so an ROI on um, customer experience, solving problems that really matter, building a business case, which is critical, especially in any economic downturn or, or recession. Um, and how do you look at customers to add value? Mm. Pick one of those and talk about it. Well, you know, the, the the chapter on the business case is always been a little bit of a, what's the right word? Well, I often would go to speak at conferences like you, Tim, and, and attend them. And the highest um, attended breakout session was always some person talking about how to demonstrate a return from your CX program. Yes. And I always found that kind of odd because it's like table stakes, right? Like no one would a thousand without knowing there's a return from that so i decided to um after kind of focusing on how you solve the right problems is to really lay out like in no uncertain terms how do you build a business case that competes for for that capital you know you should have a business case that competes for a new product development project or buying back stock like that's the level of how how you, how dry your powder should be here because if you can't prove it why are you doing it so we lay out kind of step by steps. How do you understand what once you know what those drivers are, you know, can you can you see there's a spending relationship between that in terms of top box score or not top box score? And then how do you assign kind of what the value is for improving those things? Um, and then the second part of it is the denominator, which is, is there savings? If you add digital channels and are able to create, you know, a great experience that are lower costs and you can reduce costs to serve, can you take credit for those margin dollar improvements. So I hope that chapter is valuable to people that read it, that are trying to say, how do I quantify the impact from making these changes? Um, because it's not a single business case. There's three levels. There's the preliminary. Then there's once you've gotten all your data collected, there's the next level, which is going to inform your plan. And then there's the quarterly update, which is guess what? We were slightly wrong on this assumption. Here's how we're correcting it to make the number, if that makes sense. And I, I think um, you also told a story that uh, I think of uh, um, to solve the problems that really matter. I think you told a story about a CEO and a call center. <laughs> I love that. So we're working with this executive team and uh, the head of operations says the CEO says, uh, hey, John, I have really good news. And he goes, what's that? He goes, we reduce the average speed of answer from 10 seconds to five seconds. And so the CEO picks up the phone like in the moment, calls their 1-800 number. Sure enough, they pick up in five seconds. Very friendly. He says, hey, thank you very much. Hangs up. He says, George, what did that cost? George says, $950,000. CEO says, I'd have waited another five seconds. <laughs> so, you know, and maybe George had like real statistics that five seconds mattered. But, you know. Uh, the face value of it was hard to kind of believe given there it was a pretty low volume call center. So that is the point. But this happens every day, Tim. There are improvements going on in organizations that from a rank order, from a return standpoint, wouldn't hit the top 10 list for customers. Um, but it's the squeaky wheel. It's like something that someone might have said or a CEO sat next to someone on a, on a plane and said, well, we got to go do that. So I just really try to confirm in that, in that um, chapter solve problems that really matter. I'll give you one last quick example in the cruise business. If you've ever been on a cruise, you know, getting on board um, can be challenging because at least in North America, you typically will fly off into Miami. Um, you've got like 4,000, 5,000 employees and customers getting on the ship. It doesn't happen in 10 minutes, right? So it'll take yeah. like 90 minutes. So this company asked us to look into this because they wanted to improve what they call embarkation. So reduce the amount of time it took customers to get on board. And, you know, quite honestly, it seemed like a pretty reasonable thing. And they'd spent money on it, like north of seven figures to reduce the time from like 60 minutes to 45 minutes or something like that. So we just got on the phone call about 20 customers. And what we noticed was, because they hadn't seen any change in spending, any change in satisfaction from the improvements they'd done. And it turned out the customer never thought of, of getting on board when they arrived in Miami. The clock started getting their 17-year-old son out of bed at 4.30 a.m. in Wisconsin. When they got to the Port of Miami, they actually felt relief that they didn't miss the cruise. 
<laughs> so, you know, you cannot miss, you have to remember the emotional context of the customer always when you're doing this type of thing and understanding what are improvements that the customer perceives and feels as value added versus what you think they should believe is value added. I, I remember talking to a conference center um, and they were having a, you know, it was about improving the, um, um, approving the, the customer experience. Um, and, and in the end, what it was, was actually in those days, it was before GPS, but it was in those days, it was about sending people a map and showing where the parking was. Yeah. Because, but, which was actually, because actually the, the customer experience started the moment you got in your car and drove to Birmingham in, um, um, and, and, and it's, there's a big one way system and, and where do I park? And, you know, you've got other things going on and have we got the tickets and, and stuff. And that's part of the customer experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is tricky. And the last thing I'll say is this is why it is important to understand digital at the same time or in advance, because there'll be technologies. And I'll say, listen, I always, the, the introduction is digital promise or peril. And I start with that story of Zoom pizza. Z-U-M-E, um, that was a very technology-centric, robotics made the pizza, and it lasted about 22 months before they, you know, went out of business. So it's like, well, wait a second, this was a great idea. But I make the point that, you know, Domino's had really improved their quality. Yep. It took about 30 minutes to get a pizza. I really didn't feel like I needed it in 10 or 15. And their pizza tracker kind of had me, you know, I kind of liked that I could say, hey, you know, Jerry says he's leaving and he's going to be there in 10 minutes. So so it's like, you always remember, you know, at the end of the day, what Spotify taught us, the transition from the attention economy to the value company, more and more with digital, I think customers are going to be more discerning about what creates real value for them versus what's something they can't live without. Because all of us are going through our credit card bills saying, honey, what is this subscription for? Really? Why did we get this? Let's get rid of it. I think in this context, we're going to have to be more discerning about the types of things we design and how we apply digital human logistical technology to create that a value proposition, but also what I talk about in the Amazon chapter, a value network, like how you link digital assets together to create powerful um, loyalty because it would be hard for a competitor to imitate is going to be a big thing in the future. I remember seeing, um, um, I'm just making a note at the uh, of this. Um, I remember uh, seeing uh, Ray Wang, I don't know if you know him, um, doing a presentation at a, a conference and he showed, you know, a number of companies and said, so which one is the, the um, uh, do you think is the most digital? And, and of course, it would be some tech company or something like that. He said, no, Domino's Pizza. And he showed the stock right. of Domino's Pizza. And it was like way up. Of every, and he said, why is that? He said, because they invested in digital. But yeah. like you said, like Lemonade and Spotify, um, uh, all of those have not just looked at the problem. They've yeah. actually thought about redesigning the business as well. And they've yeah. done some sneaky things as well because was it they gave a 30-minute promise and they worked out they could actually get a pizza to you in 25 minutes or something like that. So they knew that they could easily get the pizza to you in 30 minutes, yeah. whereas you actually thought they'll never do that. Yeah, right. Well, no, and yeah, Domino's is a great – I wish I – you and I both wish we bought their stock at 25 Absolutely. minutes box right um but no domino's are a great example there was a lot of great companies the reason why i picked the ones i did was because i was looking for you know I, you, when you you know tim the hardest part about writing a book is finalizing t the title <laughs> and so the publisher and i went back and forth on digital first and i just did a linkedin article and a post about you know does digital first mean people second and the answer, of course, is no. The reason why we ended up calling it digital first is number one is that's typically the way you interact with a brand these days. Very few people walk into a store without visiting the website or downloading their mobile app. I mean, so it tends to be. And the second reason is what I noticed about companies, like especially in Silicon Valley, is they tend to think digital first. So we did a big project for um, a company in the digital payments business a few years ago. I remember sitting in the CEO's office waiting for him to come in. And on his wall was um, a letter from a, a, another one of his colleagues that said, hey, congratulations on your 140th millionth customer. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I didn't have a lot of clients with 140 million customers other than like a bank in China, you know. And I thought it's interesting. That mindset is a digital mindset. You know, what I mean, the way they think about growth is, is, is enabled by these flywheel effects and same side and cross side network effects. 
And so my friend Jeff Parker, or, or I should say David Rogers says, you know, build platforms, not products. And Jeff Parker and his team wrote a great book called Platform Revolution that shows you how to do that. More companies need to think in the terms of, of platforms that create cycles of growth as opposed to just static products. Not that a, a static product isn't a good thing, but in 2023 and beyond, um, more and more, if you're not competing in a digital ecosystem, you're going to be moved out of it. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much for coming on um, and, um, and talking about your book, uh, The Digital First Customer Experience. Um, I'm going to ask you a really obvious question. Where can people buy it? Well, Amazon.com is in a bad place. <laughs> so they could definitely get it on Amazon. Um, thank you so much for um, um, uh, the book. I think it's excellent. As I said, I read it on holiday. Really enjoyed it. Um, and, and it's a page turner because... It is, you know, you get into the, well, maybe I'm just a, um, a geek or something, but, you know, the, 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 the lemonade and the Spotify and, and the detail that you go to in terms of those case studies is just excellent. Tip. Thanks, um, for, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. I'm, I'm, where, where can people find you? Uh, cxdigital.ai or joewheeler.co. Okay. So say that again because you just broke up. co okay brilliant joe thank you so much for coming on and talking about your book um and um and, and thank you so much thanks tim thanks joe thanks